Good afternoon, um, and thanks a lot for inviting me to this nice place. Um, so I want to give this kind of survey about uh, recent progress that is almost 10 years old by now, about problems that were actually st that started more than 70 years ago uh, and um, were well, in the talk I may sound maybe even more exciting uh, or excited than, uh, than you might uh, think appropriate, but I am, because it's really something that has happened and has revolutionized a, 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 a large sub-field in combinatorial geometry and to some extent computational geometry too. Um, so what, how do I... This way? Yes, okay. Um, no? hmm? I guess this too, yes. Hmm? So that's fine. Sorry. Um, okay, so. Um, so the, the talk is mostly on, on combinatorial geometry uh, where the challenge is to estimate uh, 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 the, the size of the complexity of structures that are defined by geometric objects. Um, and it's probably fair to say that the founding father of the whole field is uh, the one and only Paul Erdes. Um, who, here he, is, here he is, died on duty in a, in a conference in uh, Warsaw. Uh, and he is really, I'm sure everybody here heard about him, uh, but he's really some, somebody else, as, as you might say. Uh, he, he really was the most pro prolific mathematician that ever lived with 1,500 papers, not a small feat, working in all kinds of areas uh, uh, and making fundamental contributions in, in all of them. Uh, and uh, uh, geometry has been one of his favorite, uh, or so we want to believe, uh, uh, topics. Um, in 1946, he wrote a three or two three page paper in the American Mathematical Monthly. Uh, and he posed these two problems. I'm going to speak mostly about the first one. The second one is also interesting, but somehow less progress has been made on it. Um, so the first problem has to do with distinct distances. You, I give you a set of endpoints in the plane, and I look at all pairs of the points. Each pair has a distance, and I want to count the number of distinct distances. I mean, uh, um, a, a distance that repeats itself, I'll count only once, and I want a lower bound. I want to ask how many distinct distances I will always get, no matter how in, in, in how degenerate a position you place uh, your points. Um, the repeated distance is the other way around. Uh, uh, at most, how many a, a pairs in the given points at, of n, n points in the plane can be in exactly the same distance, say one, which is apparently an even harder problem than the distinct distances, given what we know now. Um, so I want to talk about the distinct distances and the incidence geometry problems that come hand to hand with it, so to speak, and mostly to, to, to talk about the algebraic new algebraic revolution, as I call it, that has introduced methods that enabled people to solve these problems that were essentially, quote unquote, unsolvable before, and say as much more about it as I can, which probably I will run out of time as usual. Um, so the talk is mostly about incidences, but distinct distances play a major role in, in, in the significance of of this particular question. So what is an incident? It's simply a, a, an interaction between a point and some object. In this slide, the objects are lines, and we are in the plane. We are given m 
points and n lines in the plane, and we want to count the number of pairs a point lies on a line uh, that, is, that are determined by these two uh, uh, sets of points. So in this picture, you see each point is counted with the multiplicity of the number of lines that pass through it, or each line is counted with the multiplicity of points that lie on it. And you, you want an upper bound. You want to ask how many such incidences can I get if I have any set of n points and any set of n lines. Um, and the kind of one of the major, the major starting point of the whole business, although the problem has been studied before too, is this seminal paper by Semeredi and Trotter from 83, which gives tight, asymptotically tight upper and lower bound for, uh, for this quantity. So the maximum number of incidences between m points and n lines is of the order m to the two third, n to the two third plus n plus n, and there are constructions that realize this. Um, so, so maybe I can skip this motivation, but let me say that incidences, although it's an interesting topic uh, uh, in its own right, again, it's, it's a very simple question that you can ask with very unexpected bounds like this two third, two third to those who see it for the first time. And the analysis, you really have to work a bit or a lot to get those bounds. But it also related to many other areas that, that some computational, some uh, uh, combinatorial geometry, and even for some strange reason it is related to, to this famous Kakea problem in mathematics in harmonic analysis, which I will not go into, into it. And it is related mostly because the methods devised for tackling incidence questions are very similar to methods that, that can be used to solve the other problems too. Um, and instead of asking a, a, about incidents just with points and lines in the plane, you can go wild and, and, and have points and everything. Uh, you can have other curves in the plane like circles. You can go to higher dimensions, have lines, curves, flats, surfaces, and so on. And you get an unlimited number of questions and each of them requires some analysis of its own. And the tight bound for point line incidences in the plane is a rare exception. In most cases, we really don't know what the true answer is. And the questions are quite hard to, to pinpoint the bound asymptotically. And so the talk is essentially about incidences, but also on distinct distances. Because the reason why incidences has become so famous, so to speak, to, to the few who know about them, uh, is because of the really dramatic progress that happened with this innocent question of Erdes from 1946, where those two characters, the, the, the heroes of the revolution, Larry Good and Nets Hawk Katz, are uh, uh, nearly completely solved you'll see in a minute what I mean by nearly using techniques from algebraic geometry, which were kind of, in retrospect, you could say that, that one would probably needed such techniques, but uh, um, it really was quite a shock to the community, and a lot of progress has happened since then. Um, so again, just to, to nail down the distinct distance uh, question, here you, you see a set of 10 points that have only five distinct distances between them. So it's much smaller than the 10 choose two possible distances if the points were in general position. <coughs> and Erdes in his paper noted that if you look at the grid, if you look at the integer lattice, square root 10 by square root 10 points, and look at the number of possible distances you get be between them, using some interesting tricks from a number theory, quite deep, the number of distinct distances is of the order of n over square root of log n. And he conjectured that this is really the worst, the smallest possible number. Any other set, that grid is the most degenerate configuration. Any other set should give you at least that many distinct distances. But the standard techniques, combinatorial 
graph theoretic, whatever, <coughs> uh, 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 failed. And after a lot of painful and, and smart progress, the best bound that people could have shown was something like that. Um, and th th there was not much to do. But that guy, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, uh, George or Yuri Elekesh, was in fact the true founding father of the new re uh, uh, revolution. He died in 2008, three months before the first breakthrough by Guten Katz came into existence, out of excessive smoking, as my say, quite young. Um, uh, but his name appears everywhere, as you'll see. He was, the, the, he was Moses on Mount Nevo, so to speak, seeing the promised land, but not allowed to enter it. Um, all the ideas, except how to prove them, were his. Um, and already back in 2000, he, he had an ingenious transformation of turning the distinct distances question into a, a question about, uh, uh, about incidences between points and lines in three dimensions. He didn't see them, that they were lines, but with appropriate choice of parameters, they are indeed lines. And he, he, he wanted several conjectures to hold, one main conjecture to hold in order to com continue the analysis. And if he could prove that conjecture, he would get the bound of n over log n, which is almost the one that Erdes has conjectured. The square root log n missing factor is still with us. We still don't know how to, to bridge over it, but that's considered by now a nearly complete solution. So, but his conjecture was too much at the time. Uh, um, and three months after his passing away, Guten Katz came up with the first breakthrough, which didn't touch the distinctness problem, used simpler methods that I, uh, uh, in algebra, not even in, in, in algebraic geometry, and, uh, and showed that the total, that the maximum possible number of joints in a set of n lines in three dimensions is n to the three. A joint is a point that lies on several of the lines, and at least three of those lines are non-coplanar. So the point, the lines that pass through the point kind of go, so to speak, in all possible directions. They are not confined to a plane. Um, I'll go back into this question because it's, it's kind of a simplest instance where one can e really see an easy proof and understand the, the ma main ideas. Um, and as Again, I'll show in a couple of slides, in a few slides, uh, the joints and the Elekesh uh, uh, transformation are very similar because they both have points and lines in three dimensions. And the points and lines that they look at are quote unquote truly three dimensional. Because that's an important thing to keep in mind if you think about incidences between points and lines in three dimensions, that the problem is totally boring because being in three dimension or in 17 dimension makes no difference. You can still have all your points and lines lie on a common plane, embed it into any dimension that you like, and you'll get just the same ready to alter bound. You cannot improve it. And, and the lower bound will hold, and the upper bound will also hold. You just project everything onto some generic plane and apply the analysis there. But if you somehow look at configurations where you cannot have too many points and lines on a common plane, then there is hope to improve the same relative total bound. And that's exactly what Elekesh wanted. And, um, um, okay. Uh, so the, the short story uh, uh, is that after Elekesh passed away, his son asked me to do something with his papers, and I found his notes and somehow published them in some kind of an incomplete form. Gutenkatz saw them, immediately realized that their joint uh, uh, tricks can be extended, not easily, and managed to solve the, the problem completely. Almost completely, they got, they proved Elekesh conjectures in a more general setup that he, than he wanted and got the N over log N lower bound. Uh, um, okay. Uh, 
commercial slide, uh, um, but I actually since their first results, the, the field has really gone into hyperdrive and there were a lot of new results. And the sentence in red indicates the end of the story, uh, uh, which is how you end the French fairy tales to children. But I, I, I just put it there because kind of in English you would say at this point and they all lived happily ever after, but it's not the end, I hope, and there are many more results and difficult solutions and difficult uh, problems to be solved in the future. Um, so I will briefly go over joints uh, uh, and I will tell you about polynomial partitioning, which is the main new tool that Gut and Katz have introduced. And then I will talk a little bit about incidences and distinct distances, some other aspects of it. Again, th these are promises. I will not be able to fulfill all of them, so don't expect too much. Let me quickly go over the joint problem, simply because it's under the, the lamp, so to speak. It's very easy to, to understand and process. Um, so again, we want to prove it was conjectures back in 1992 that if you have n lines, three dimensions, you can have at most n to the three half points, each lying on three of the lines and not all the lines on the point, through the point are called planar. So if you look at this grid construction, root n by root n by root n points, and look at all the axis parallel lines that they determine, you get three n lines and n to the three half points. And every point is a joint, obviously, because it has lines through it in all possible directions. So this is construction shows that n to the three half is the best possible bound. It's a lower bound, but you want an upper bound. Um, so this was the first breakthrough of Guten Katz. And in fact, in retrospect, there is even a simpler proof that I will try to sketch here. Uh, um, um, or maybe I won't, I don't know, let's see. Uh, and you can extend it easily, the proof works in any dimension D, and the number of joints for N lines in D dimensions is N to the D over D minus one, tight, both upper and lower uh, bounds. Uh, and now a joint is a point where you have at least D lines passing through it and not all in a common hyperplane. Um, um, Okay, just to be safe on time, let me skip the proof, which is kind of, it's nice, and, and, but let me skip it, and if there is time at the end, I'll go back to it. Um, it, it uses algebra, but uh, let me kind of, um, okay. Uh, uh, let me make sure that I can tell you more about newer stuff. So again, they lived happily, not, not uh, 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 and had many children. And the, the several slides that come, I made them mostly to myself, just to, to realize that there were a lot of progress in the area. I will not really expand on, on what you see here, um, but uh, for example, the unit incidences, unit distances in three dimensions, how many pairs of points lie a distance one in three dimensions is actually a question about incidences between points and unit spheres in three dimensions for which there are bounds that are not known to be tight but still um, and all kinds of, uh, uh, of other incidence related results that are all connected to, uh, um, to, to, to these new tricks in algebraic geometry that I will talk about later. Um, there is by now only one significant algorithmic application like computational geometry, range searching with semi-algebraic ranges that I'll talk about later. Um, and, and with a student, Noam Solomon, we have bounds on the number of incidences between points and lines in four dimensions. A, a general bounds for incidences between points and curves and, and even in more general setups in this paper of Fox et al, uh, and so on. Uh, and then there, there is a, a branch of 
study about distinct distances where you assume that the points lie in special position, <coughs> like on a curve or on, its, on a surface. And there are quite a few papers by now that uh, 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 give better bounds than this n over root log n, etc., for such special configurations. Um, and the first bullet is something that I also try to say something about later because it connects everything in a, in a new way, sort of an old new way, um, and, and on and on. And the, the, the most recent results in these directions are, are bounds for uh, elim eliminating depth cycles for lines and triangles in three dimensions. Uh, um, and, and on and on. Okay, so the new tools, I will say more about them in a minute, come from algebra and algebraic geometry. Um, the polynomial partitioning is the most important one, but some of the results use classical algebraic geometry like the Tom Milner theorem, Bezu is used all over, a, a, some generalization by Warren of the Tom Milner theorem are also used and so on and so forth. And then kind of a major thing in doing the analysis a, 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 of good and cuts for points and lines in three dimensions come from a, a really ancient algebraic geometry a, from the 19th century, a, 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 most notably by Cayley and Salmon, where similar results were also obtained by Monge. Um, when I said that the, the time when algebraic geometry was algebraic geometry, um, the, the area has by now become a very deep, very successful, but very abstract mathematical discipline, <coughs> where the emphasis now is on algebra. Geometry is hidden as a motivation or as an application, but the, the ma main analysis is algebra. And but in the good old days, the motivation was geometry, and people did beautiful stuff with, with geometry, except that quite a few of the results were wrong because they thought geometrically and, and missed some special cases that they couldn't handle and so on and so forth. The new algebraic sweep over the area made it more uh, rigorous and precise, but the geometry was somehow a bit or a lot, depending on the point of view, lost. Anyway, I'll say a few things about it later. So just a couple of slides about Elekesh transformation. Um, the trick in his transformation is to look at the space of all rigid motions in the plane, which you can think of as rotations, because each one of them, if not pure translation, is always a rotation about some point. Um, it has three degrees of freedom, because you two of translation and one of rotation. So you can think about them as points in three dimensions. And the basic observation is that if you, uh, if you have two pairs of points, A, B, and A prime, B prime, and the distance from A to B is the distance equal to this of A prime to B prime, then there is a unique rigid motion that takes A to A prime and B to B prime, and this is if and only if. If there is such a motion, the distances are equal, and, and, and if distances are equal, it's very easy to find such a rotation. Um, and um, so Elekesh's trick was to take each pair of points, not A and B, but A and A prime, and assign to them a line, as it turns out, in three dimensions, which is the locus of all rotations that take A to A prime. With proper parameterization, it is, it is indeed a line. So if A, B is equal to A prime, B prime, it means that the line of A and A prime and the line of B and B prime in three dimensions meet each other at the point that is the rotation that takes A to A prime and B to A prime. So the problem is reduced to contacts between points, between lines in three dimensions or between points and lines where the points are those rotations. Um, and Elekesh conjecture for after doing some algebra to, to, to get this thing further on is that if you have a set of 
lines in three dimensions, then the number of points where at least k of the lines pass through them, a k-rich point, which, are the, which is the same as the number of rotations that map k points of the given set to k other points, is the number of lines to the three half divided by k square. In, in, in the distinct distances problem, the number of lines is n square because it's the number of pairs of points in your set. So he wanted to show that it is n cube over k square. Um, okay, so, so as I already said, this was the first formulation of problems about incidences in higher dimensions. And, and of course, it opened up the door for all kinds of variations that you might think about. But the nice thing about it is that if you looked at those problems just a couple of years back, you had no idea how to approach them. They were really problems that people thought that will not be solved in our lifetime. And now they are more or less following. It's not that you press a button and you solve a problem. You have to work quite hard. Uh, but you can solve them, or at least make significant progress in all of them. Um, okay, and now, Elekesh conjecture is an immediate consequence of, the, of the, an equivalent way to state the good cuts result, which says that if you have m points and n lines in three dimensions, but again, as I told you before, they should be truly three-dimensional. You do not want to see all the points and lines on a common plane. And, and the way to do it is to assume that no more than root n of the lines lie on any common plane. And the Elekesh setup satisfies this property. And then the number of incidences between the points and the lines is this bound, which is better than the semi ready total bound. The one half three quarters is better than two thirds, two thirds if you work out the details. And and from this, you get Elekesh conjecture simply by, by saying that if you want to, to, to look at points that are incident to at least k lines, then here you simply write k times m. Each point, the number of incidences is at least k times m. Each point is to k lines. And if you solve km equal to this upper bound for m, you get exactly Elekesh conjecture. Um, so this is the thing to, to establish. And the new trick that they introduced was this polynomial partitions, partitioning business. And their original statement is, as, goes as follows. So I give you n points in d dimensions and some parameter t. And I want to split the points into roughly t subsets so that each subset will contain about n over t points. Now, of course, you can do it trivially in, in so many ways. But the trick is that you can do it with a polynomial. You can construct a polynomial whose degree is of the order of t to the 1 over d, one of the dimension, so that the sets that you want are the points that lie in the individual connected components of the complement of the zero set. Z of f is the zero set of the polynomial. It partition d dimensional space into connected cells. And each cell will contain at most n over t, t points. And the number of cells will be order of t, which follows by some Milner, Tom Milner, Warren type argument. So that's the result. The proof is non-constructive. It is based on the borsuk ulam machinery, polynomial ham sandwich, I have no time to say anything about it. But it might look something like this in the plane. You have your points. The blue is the zero set of the polynomial. And then you have a, a, a connected components like this one. And each one contains, say, in this picture, at most two points. Some points may lie on the zero set, which is an issue. And you don't know how many. So this would be the, con the uh, construction. Now, as it turns, the first part is exactly the restatement of good and, uh, and cut's result, except that they now tell you the degree. And from the degree, you construct the polynomial of that degree. The number of cells is, is of the order of degree to the dimension. And each cell contains n over d to the d. 
ECD. A recent result of good extends it to from points to lines or flats or curves or surfaces of any fixed dimension. So if you're in n dimension, have k dimensional surfaces, algebraic surfaces of constant degree, simple, uh, and I specify some degree d, you can again construct a polynomial of degree d. It will have d to the d connected components. Now each component will be crossed by roughly the same number of your objects. So this is the correct number uh, uh, on average, no matter what your polynomial looks like, if you do the calculation, but uh, 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 good results guarantees it for every cell. That's even harder to prove than the original good and cuts result. Okay, so here, for example, um, uh, uh, so this would be one of those connected components, and it is crossed by only a few lines in this case, uh, um, as specified by his statement. Um, so polynomial partition is a great tool because it is ideally tailored for divide and conquer. You have a big problem in the entire space. You break space into smaller pieces. You solve the problem in each piece separately. You add up the result that you get, and, and you get something significant from, from the partition. Uh, uh, there were similar methods going back to the early 1990s, but they could, could not, they were weaker in certain senses. They could not handle point sets. They could partition other things. I don't want to go into, into the details. So this is a new way to partition space according to underlying ge geometric objects that are given to you. And that's, a, again, is the major thing, theme that appears in most of the recent development. So let me spend a couple of slides on how you use polynomial partitioning to prove Gutenkatz bound. Uh, um, so it's kind of easy, but it's not. Uh, uh, so the first step is that you choose a degree here is the degree, but never mind, some degree. And you're in, in three dimensions, you get d cube cells of the complement of the polynomial, of the zero set. Each contains m over d cube points, and each is crossed by n over d square lines using Good's recent result. And now you need, within each cell, a trivial bound on the number of incidences, and that's the most trivial one can think of. Uh, uh, um, if you have a point, how many lines can pass through it? Well, each line that passes through the point passes through some other point, and there are only m minus one other points, so you can get at most m minus one lines passing through the point. So that's why point square. But if the line has only that point, you cannot use this argument, so you add the number of lines. So it's really as trivial as you could do, but if you just substitute this, these quantities, you get that bound. And if you multiply it by the number of cells, which is d cube, you get this bound. m squared over d uh, uh, cube plus n d. And now you just choose the d that equalizes these two terms, which is this number. You substitute it here or here, and you get this m to the one half of the sigma. End of story. Except, as Hamlet already said, <coughs> uh, 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 you have no idea how to handle the points that lie on the zero set of the polynomial. First of all, you don't know how many of them will be, maybe all of them, or a large part of them, and, uh, and, and so there is no partitioning, there is no divide and conquer, there is no, no divide, and what do you do? So this is where you really have to work hard for each problem, and this is where algebraic geometry enters again. Uh, uh, on top of the uh, polynomial partitioning business. Uh, because in the good cut setup, you really ask yourself, how many incidences can I get between points and lines on a two-dimensional variety, the zero set of the polynomial in three dimensions? And, and, and now you need even more advanced algebraic geometry tools because you ask yourself a very simple question. If I give you a surface of degree D in three dimensions, can it contain lines? Yes. Can it contain many lines? Maybe. How many lines can it contain? Well, it can contain infinitely many lines, but then it has to be a ruled surface, a surface ruled by lines. For example, this hyperboloid of one 
uh, uh, shift that you can do, you can do yourself by taking two disks and connect strings and just turn one of them a little bit, you'll get this picture. There is another set of lines passing through it kind of in, in a different direction. Um, but, but so this is a ruled surface. It has a line through each point of it. And this is another one, the hyperbolic paraboloid, like z equals x, y. Again, it has a two systems of generating lines. But if it is not ruled, then this classical Cayley, Salmon, Monge, whatever results of the 19th century say that if a surface that is not ruled can have at most 11 d square lines. Which is kind of a very deep property and interesting in itself. Um, okay. So the, the argument continues without getting into details as follows. So if the, if the zero set is not ruled, then it cannot contain too many lines and you somehow handle it because some induction argument, never mind. If it is ruled, the two surfaces I showed you are doubly ruled. Every point is incident to two lines that line it, but even, so, so you can get two incidences. That's not much. But if the surface is singly ruled, the generators do not meet one another almost at all except at singular points of the surface, and singular points are special. You can handle them separately. Again, no details provided. Uh, and that's more or less what finishes the argument, except one last point, that the zero set of the polynomial could also contain planes. And, and then there is nothing to do. If the points and lines lie on a plane, you lost your three-dimensionality, you have to apply some ready trotter. But now comes into play the assumption that no plane contains too many lines, and the incidences that you can get on those planes are not enough to kill the bound, which is still n to the one up, n to the three quarter, etc. From this, you get Elekesh conjecture, and from the Elekesh algebra, in a few more lines, you get the lower bound on distinct distances. Okay. Um, uh, let me say a few words about uh, algorithmic applications just computational geometry after all, not combinatorial. So the, the most significant result, at least my opinion, is range searching with semi-algebraic ranges by uh, uh, Agarwal, Matushet, and myself. So the setup is that I give you a set of points, and I give you ranges that are semi-algebraic of constant complexity. So may I say it? Uh, 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 so they are defined, say, like, balls, ellipsoids, uh, whatever. It takes constant degree and constant amount of inequalities to define each of them. And you want to pre-process the points into some data structure so that if I give you such a range, you'll tell me quickly how many points it contains uh, 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 or, or report all the points it contains and so on. You can think about it as an offline kind of uh, pun a, a, a incidence question because now you don't want a, the point to lie on the bound, on the a surface, but inside, so to speak. But it still looks and, and feels very much like the same problem. Now, back in the 90s, when people started to, to, to think about range searching, which was a major item in computational geometry, they mostly worked with uh, half spaces bounded by uh, hyperplanes. And then they were able to show, and that was really quite a significant set of results, that if you are allowed about linear storage, you can answer a query of how many points lie in a half plane, half space, in time that is roughly n to the 1 minus 1 over d. So it deteriorates as d goes up, but in the plane, say, it's root n. Uh, and what we were able to show using polynomial partitioning and, and to build some data structure uh, that you can get the same bound also for ranges that are bounded by algebraic surfaces of constant degree. Um, and, and let me just say that, that the main difficulty in obtaining this result is that the construction of the partitioning polynomial based on the bursuk ulam and hem sandwich fixed point or whatever a, a, a analysis does not lead to an efficient algorithm for its construction. 
And so we found a roundabout way of approximating it or whatever, but that's an interesting challenge of how to, how to algorithmize, so to speak, all those machinery. Now, do I still have some time? Hmm? 10 minutes, great. Okay, so now I want to kind of show you a different angle, more recent set of developments that's, that in some sense ties everything together in a different direction. And, and okay, I'll go soon into the main theory, but let me start with this uh, uh, question. Again, a distinct distances question, and now back in the plane, you have two lines, I'll show you the figure, two lines, on each of them you have some number of points, uh, so P1 is a set of points on one line, P2 is a set of, uh, uh, of the others, each of them say has n points, and you look at the number of distinct distances between the, the lines, between the sets, not within a set, but between, bet between them, and you want a lower bound that would be large, larger than this n over root square root log n, for example, because the points are in special position somehow, and indeed you can show that the number of distinct distances in this case is n to the fourth third. Um, but for this you have to assume that the lines are not parallel and not per orthogonal. If the lines are parallel, it's very easy to get only a linear number of distinct distances, just place the points one, two, three, four on one line, one, two, three, four on the other line, there are only a linear number of distinct distances if you calculate it. But if the lines are orthogonal, you can also do it using the Pythagorean theorem, put the points at, the, at distances one, square root two, square root three, and so on on one line, and the same on the other. And again, the number of different hypotenuses that you would get there is only linear. So if the points, if the lines are orthogonal or parallel, there is nothing you can do. But if they are not, you get this n to the fourth third. How? Uh, um, okay, so again, Elekesh. Elekesh is everywhere. Uh, uh, so uh, Elekesh and Ronai showed something that I'll state in, in the minute. Uh, uh, and Elekesh later, a year earlier, but that doesn't count, uh, uh, managed to improve it to n to the five quarters. But we were able to get and to the four third. Um, now, the way we proved it was applying a, an ad hoc technique that reduces the problem to incidences between points and hyperbolas in the plane and using some, some incidence bounds for that. But I want to show that this point, this problem is a special case of another kind of topic that Again, Elekesh was involved in it in two papers, Elekesh Rona in, in 2000 and Elekesh Sabo in 2012. The referee sat on that paper for a long time, as you can see. And we simplified and, and improved both bounds in two recent results. Um, so, and, and, and this is like a, a completely different question, which as you will see in a minute, is more, more or less the same question. So now change the rules of the game and which now go as follows. I give you three sets of real numbers. Sometimes they can also be complex. Think of real. Say each of, of n points. And I give you a trivariate polynomial of constant degree, f, x, y, z. And I look at the Cartesian product, a times b times c, it's a non-uniform grid, so to speak. And I ask how many zeros can the polynomial f have on such a grid? How many points of the grid can it vanish? Rather than talk about the general results, which is in the second paper of Elekesh, let me talk about the very special case where the polynomial is in fact the graph of a bivariate function, polynomial. So it's of the form z equal fxy, or z minus fxy equals zero. Um, okay, so, so in fact, I, I, the question is, how, uh, so how many points of the grid can the graph of such a polynomial pass? 
Um, it is clearly at most n square. For each point of A and each point of B, you get a value. And if that value lies in your third set, you are happy, but you cannot get more than one. So you'll get at most n square, and you can get n square in two trivial uh, 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 constructions. You can take A, B, and C to be just the integers, and take the polynomial to be x plus y. Or you can take the A, B, and C to be powers of two, and take the polynomial to be the product, x times y. But the really amazing thing due to Elekesh and Rona is that these are the only two possibilities. So you cannot get quadratically many zeros unless your polynomial is one of those four. Now, that's not quite true. The, the precise formulation is like that. That if you have such a bivariate polynomial and, and its graph vanishes on quadratically many points of some Cartesian product of this form, then F must be of one of those two special forms. It is the sum or the product of two polynomials and you compose them by a third polynomial P. It's essentially X plus Y and X times Y in, after you change, after change of variables, of coordinates. And what we were able to show is that if that's not the case, if F does not have the special form, then the number of zeros is way below quadratic. It is at most n to the 11, 6. Um, and how is this connected to this uh, 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 distinct distance problem? Because there is a natural polynomial that you can construct here, just call X the distance along one line from the origin, so to speak, and Y the distance from the other, and so the square distance between a point here and a point here, just by the law of cosines, is, is that polynomial. So now we need this Cartesian product. We take A to be P1, parameterized by X, B to be P2, parameterized by Y, and C to be the set of the square distances that you can get between P1 and P2. Now, they are not of the same cardinality, but the analysis applies here as well. And so, so here, is, here we have all the ingredients. We have a polynomial, we have three sets. And how many zeros can the polynomial have? have? Exactly n squared, because every point in P1 and every point in P2 gives you a distance that is in C. C is the set of all such dis distances. Does F have the special form? So it's kind of easy to see that no, if the angle is not 0 or pi over 2, and yes, if the angle is 0 or pi over 2. Okay. You can hopefully see it yourself. Um, so, when, so when it has the special form, the Elekesh, Ronei, etc. result has nothing to say. But if it doesn't, then uh, uh, we have this n to the 11, 6. Except that the sets are not of the same cardinality, but the result actually is, is not n to the 11, 6, but it is this. If you add up the exponents, you'll get 11, 6. But, but now it allows you to use sets of different sizes. This is n, this is n, this you don't know, but you know that the answer is n square. You solve this inequality, and you get that c must be at least n to the fourth. So, so there, there is a lot of things going on here, and, and this elekesh ronai sabot theory is something different. No polynomial partitioning and nothing, but still algebra, and algebraic geometry to some extent, that gets you solutions of the same kind of problems in a somewhat different way. Okay, so don't read. Um, but let me just say that the last bullet is where, is where the kind of holy grail is now. Distinct distances in three dimensions. Uh, Elekesh, the grid construction give you a lower bound of n to the two third an upper bound, and Elekesh, and so the Erdes conjecture that it is also a lower bound. And if you apply Elekesh's idea to this thing, you get incidences between points and two-dimensional or three-dimensional surfaces in, in five, six, or seven dimensions, depend, depending on how you parameterize it, and that's beyond us at the moment. So that's really is the big next open problem, uh, hopefully to be solved soon. Thank you.